So we'll continue with this uh, with this event with as long as people want to keep uh, uh, talking, and the panel is going to be happy to respond. Uh, we've received the message from the group that just spoke, and uh, we, we recognize their uh, their their uh, opinion and the manner in which they've made it. But for those who are in the room, we'll continue. So uh, maybe I'll start with asking the panel to perhaps respond to some of the comments that were made before the break, uh, especially there were some very specific comments on uh, on the labor standard and on the uh, and on the indigenous peoples aspect. Well, welcome back, everyone, uh, and to those online. Um, let me start by picking up on some of the. Uh, issues raised in the in the first session and uh, addressing those uh, and, and in no particular order and apologies for um, so that some that I've missed out because there were there were quite some long interventions um, there um, firstly with, with regard to use of um, country frameworks what's very important as I mentioned earlier is to not only assess the framework, but also to look at the capacity and the commitment of the um, the borrowing country, the project to meet the the commitments uh, contained within the environment and social standards. So that that goes without saying from from our perspective. And the methodology we've put out a, a little paper which talks about the methodology, the approach we would take to looking at country frameworks. Uh, that is also a work in progress, and we look to look forward to having any observations and comments from stakeholders uh, on that that particular approach, that document. I, I, I wanted to touch on the issue of um, livelihood restoration. Um, it, it may not be coming clearly through in the in the draft, but it is our intention that livelihood restoration should be looked at on projects. Um, particularly through um, ESS1, which deals with uh, environment and social assessment. So if we have waste pickers, they need to be looked, uh, looked at and um, assisted through the course of the project. If we're thinking of downstream uh, water users, um, fishermen or whatever, on a, on a hydropower project or whatever, those people need to be um, safeguarded also. So there is, there is an intention to look at livelihood restoration in projects. There also um, seemed to be uh, an, an, a notion that we weren't going to be considering a broader range of impacts outside the, um, the immediate nature of the, the physical project footprint. Uh, we have mentioned in the document the need to look at cumulative impacts, to look at direct and indirect impacts. Uh, clearly, if that's not coming through strongly enough, then we need to, we need to look at the wording, but those issues need to be covered. And when we talk about vulnerability, we, uh, I spoke about a few areas where people could be considered vulnerable this morning. But just to emphasize that we're taking a broad view of this. So we're, we're looking at vulnerability from also the perspective of whether people are landless, whether they are uh, of low caste, whether they are poor. All these elements need to be, need to be considered in the social assessment. And, um, there was also a suggestion that we weren't considering the pollution pays principle. I think that's fairly well embedded in, in ESS3, but just to say that clearly, uh, that we do uphold that, that, that particular principle. There was a point that um, maybe ESS2 is, uh, is counter to attempts at harmonization. It's fair to say that if you, if you look at the broad range of safeguard policy standards amongst the MDB community, um, amongst the um, export credit agencies and others. Um, whilst they're all more or less the same, there are obviously differences. You know, some might be better on one particular issue than, than another. And clearly we, we've heard that the, the current approach uh, with, with regard to labor issues um, disquietens a, a lot of people. We've had discussions full days discussions and ongoing discussions with the ILO about their particular concerns around the fundamental principles, the 1998 fundamental principles, and we're working with ILO in a collaborative manner to uh, address their concerns. But I think it is important to, to recognize that if you compare the existing 
operational policies with the new draft. The new draft does represent a considerable step forward in the way in which the bank is addressing environmental and social issues, not only in the breadth of the issues that are covered, the range of issues that are covered, but also the rigour with which we want those issues to be dealt with. And we've signalled our intent that the framework not only involves the policy and the, the 10 standards, but also a whole series of mandatory requirements on the part of the bank, but also on the part of the borrower that will deal with uh, many of the issues that have been raised in, in much more detail. So how to carry out a socioeconomic survey um, on projects will be covered, how we deal with biodiversity issues will be covered and, and, and so on. Turning to the, the issue of biodiversity, as I mentioned, the, the new standard sets a broader framework than the existing operational policies on forests and natural habitats. And even within those existing documents, there is the concept of offsetting and uh, critical habitat. I want to be very clear, though, that we are not proposing any um, increase in offsetting as a, as a general notion. Uh, offsetting is the last resort when one employs the mitigation hierarchy. So the, the, the first thing is to identify impacts, to try and avoid impacts, to minimize impacts, and a final resort could be, could be offsetting. But offsetting is, uh, is, is not something to be undertaken lightly, and we need to be very sure, and I think we've set a very high benchmark, uh, with, particularly with reference to critical habitats, that needs to be uh, followed before we would consider um, offsetting uh, any, any impacts, adverse impacts on critical habitats. I'll stop there now and I'll just pass to my colleagues who may have a better memory than me and pick up some of the issues that um, Okay, um, we had um, a, a number of questions about the coverage of instruments uh, and then there was a statement made about uh, the perception that the, the, um, there's, uh, the, the, the range, the, the, the share of uh, lending going to uh, policy-based lending is, is growing. just like to clarify that, that that's a misperception. Uh, development policy lending typically in the World Bank is counter-cyclical, meaning uh, the World Bank tends to lend more on development policy financing during economic crisis. During the economic crisis a number of years ago, uh, in FY09 to 10, it did increase. It did in, indeed increase to about 40 percent. Since then, it's declined to 24 or 26 percent uh, last year. Um, so it's, it's very clear that there's no trend. Uh, I'd just like to emphasize that there really is no trend. This does vary from year to year. There's no trend. Now, um, I'd just also like to clarify again, the bank does look at environmental and social aspects in all its instruments. It looks at this in a different way in development policy financing according to the policy provisions set out in OP 860 because it's a different instrument. Uh, unlike investment financing, which is what we're talking about here, Development policy financing does not finance specific investments, so it does not have uh, projects with a physical footprint. It doesn't finance uh, power plants, it doesn't finance roads, it doesn't finance dams. It essentially gives budget support in support for a development program. And as such, the provisions that are set out in OP860 clearly say that uh, the bank needs to determine whether the program policies supported by the World Bank's development policy financing does have a significant effect on the country's environment, forests, or other natural resources. And that's the policy provision that's set out in OP860. Uh, it's going to be looked at, the, um, the experience with that, in line with our tradition of looking at this uh, on a regular basis in our um, retrospective that is underway at the moment and will um, be prepared during the course of FY15. Uh, and. Uh, Based on previous experiences, we've used these uh, retrospectives to uh, refine and improve the uh, application of uh, OP860. So, for instance, in previous years, uh, based on the experience uh, and lesson learned from the retrospectives, uh, guarantees were incorporated in development policy financing. And this year, there will be a particular focus on the environmental social provisions. This will also be looked at in IEG evaluations. Thanks. Um, there are a few points that were raised by uh, uh, colleagues who are no longer in the room. There was uh, quite a, 
there was a comment that um, everything needs to be looked at within nine words that give the bank the right to decide the appropriate time frame. Uh, for those who are interested in that particular issue, um, those nine words don't sit by themselves. I'd ask um, attention be paid to standard one, paragraph 36, which provides the detail about how that time frame would uh, weigh, um, uh, take place by saying, for example, that within that specified time frame, you have to avoid, minimize, reduce, or mitigate risks and impacts of the project. Borrower cannot carry out any activities in relation to that project that may cause material or significant adverse environmental or social risks or impacts. So indeed, there is a standard that's connected to those nine words that was um, uh, not referred to earlier, but as I mentioned, I think that person's no longer in the room. Um, there was also a comment about unprotected workers in the labor context. I think the questioner has also left um, a point in that context is that the World Bank Group environmental health and safety guidelines are required to be applied under this new framework. And those guidelines have a very clear, detailed um, uh, set of requirements on occupational health and safety. So those provisions on occupational health and safety indeed would apply to project workers. So they would be protected in the occupational health and safety context. In, and in addition, I think some of the points on the labor uh, have portrayed um, the landscape as being more uniform than it actually is. Um, because indeed, in the case of the Asian Development Bank, uh, they don't really have a labor policy. They have a labor guideline. Um, and so in uh, uh, that part of, um, of the world, um, we don't have a uniform approach. And in addition, some of the MDBs that have been referred to, unlike the World Bank, are largely operating uh, in a private sector sphere, not a public sector sphere. So again, it's not, uh, it's not the uniform landscape that uh, was portrayed. Um, on um, the point about pre prior informed consent should, um, should apply in all settings, um, and this reference to forced um, forced eviction, the free prior informed um, consent has to be looked at in the fact that all, um, probably every member uh, country in the bank, uh, including this one, applies the principle of eminent domain. Resettlement occurs in all uh, in all uh, countries. What uh, the World Bank has had for years has been the leading policy seen as international best practice on resettlement. Mark referred to it. Um, and indeed, in this new uh, draft, there are provisions that say if you're carrying out eminent domain or if you're carrying out resettlement, it must be done in accordance not only with the bank's uh, standards for compensation, livelihood restoration, but has to be done in accordance with with due principles of due process. Those principles are not in the current safeguards, but now explicit, explicitly laid out in the new um, standard. There was also a comment about no detail on how the country system would work, but Mark referred to annexes that we'd put out, and I'd refer you to our website where we now have a detailed note on how indeed we would uh, work in um, developing and uh, helping to implement uh, the borrower's system. Thank you. What is this? Yeah. So we can take another round of uh, questions or observations or comments. Um, we could, uh, we could, uh, and especially on on some of the issues that may not have yet got uh, discussed, uh, indigenous peoples, for example, or. Uh, again, anything that anyone wants to raise from the floor at this point. And, yes, yeah, sorry, are you? Yeah. 
Kristen Haidt. I'm here. I work with Vicki Tally Corpus, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, and just had a couple of points, most of which I think have already been raised, but to reinforce. Um, first is concern that the policies apply to the borrowers, of course. Okay. First is the concern that the policies now apply much more to the borrowers um, as opposed to the bank, and so um, hoping for more clarity on the lines of accountability. Um, and supervision and, and the role of the bank. Um, concerned that there's no reference to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, in, in the policy. And um, also concerned about the limitations on the scope, ex explicitly excluding P4R and DPLs. Um, and noting also that the financial intermediaries um, the threshold seems to be there's a, a lot of room for discrepancy and raising a little bit of concerns about what that can mean. Um, a some concerns about the financial intermediaries and how the standards will apply in that context, um, including with respect to the common approach options. Um, and concerned about the very limited references to human rights obligations generally. Um, appreciating the, there, that there are a few references to international treaties and agreements, um, but would prefer to see more language um, explicitly highlighting human rights. IFC performance standards do that, for example, and um, a little bit of concern that that's not here. Um, thank you. Anyone else? Otherwise, we can go straight to the panel. Yes, Mohammed, can you get a mic? Um, so, the, I mean, uh, thank you for your responses. Now, I think what we need to hear more from you uh, uh, is uh, further elaboration on the comments that we heard in the, first, in the previous round of questions concerning national sovereignty. Uh, Yes, there are annexes, but it seems that civil, we as civil society, it's, I mean, it's, it, these are not still clear for us. Uh, governments have different approaches. Each country has a different approach. Uh, so to what extent the World Bank is going to be flexible, but in the same time would not get trapped into the dilution of principles just because you want to respect borrowers decisions on how to conduct things according to their uh, uh, country systems this is very important to uh, to address um, we all hear about intentions you in our intention you 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 keep referring to that uh, I think one of my colleagues from Egypt said that good intentions do not necessarily make a difference. Uh, we want to see something more concrete in the language you are using. Uh, um, we really appreciate the, the time and the efforts. You're, we, we trust you're, you have good intentions, at least uh, what I'm hearing from the panelists here. Well, I'm, I, I mean, uh, I'm not sure about other staff members at the bank. Uh, people at, at the operational level usually get really intimidated when we address these things with them. So also I think what we are uh, trying to envision that this safeguard is going to create a new culture at the bank, a new mentality, uh, a new attitude by operational staff members. Uh, because I mean every time we talk to people in, the op in operations, as if like we are stepping on their toes, they, or we are sitting in a classroom with a teacher with a stick, because we don't know and they don't they know. So again, this is a very important uh, thing that we need to address uh, as uh, concern uh, considering the significance of the safeguards. And last point I want to make: uh, your perspective on equity. Again, please don't tell me my in, our intentions. Uh, we need to see more concrete steps to enhance a bottom-top development approach. Um, so, what your what what your what's your perspective on that? 
Thank you. So um, we'll, uh, we'll get some of the, the panel to respond to some of the specific comments, but let me turn to Kyle Peters, uh, Vice President for Operations Policy and Country <laughs> Services, to for his some um, intervention. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I, I just want to say that we really appreciate um, all the comments and suggestions that we've heard. I, 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 let me just start, um, and I actually have to go to close another session, so I, I wanted to say something before I left. I, first, I, I want to say that, um, as the President said in the CSO, ta CSO Town Hall earlier this week, we, we really uh, intend to extend the consultations um, to, to sort of, so that we um, really do them right. We also, as he said, intend to resource this, the implementation of, of, the, of the safeguards and the standards appropriately. And I think that's a commitment that we all make. Um, and and I, I just want to say that also I've heard very much all the feedback on, on, on the consultations and on the process. And um, it's, you know, during the annual meetings, everyone's in Washington. So in the next week, I'm going to, we, we'll have um, a discussion with the, the country directors. And, and, and I think I, I just will very much reinforce the message that, that I'm hearing from you, from you that, um, that the, you know, we need to have the schedules that are well known in advance. We need to have uh, con um, consistency in our approach across the country offices. We need to be inclusive in our approach, and we need to make sure that all the documents are available for you. And and that we will we will come back and we, we'll we'll go through. That. I think that's the a minimum, as someone said about the consultation process in the World Bank. And and we'll, I will reiterate the message and work with the team to make sure that happens. Um, I think um, there have also been a, a lot of questions about um, uh, uh, very much about the implementation and the process. And I very much share the view that if we move, we're moving to a process where, where there's a lot more focus on implementation, then we need to we need to have the resources in the organization that that um, that we one needs to have to ensure that we have implementation support and supervision that's consistent with the requirements of these standards. And I know I'm working with the with the we're working with the global practices. And uh, with the safeguards advisors who we've uh, put into a group so that we have a more centralized approach to that. So we hear you very much on the implementation side. And then the last points, I think they were construct, um, the, the last comments made that uh, about, about the language. I mean, I, I think the whole point um, we, uh, that we really want to say is that um, we appreciate the comments on the language. I think from hearing this conversation and hearing the intentions of what we're doing, there's really, there, I think there is some language issues about because I think we fully intended to do many of the things that have been raised here, and we need to go through these, uh, go through the standards, go through the guidelines that will come, and make sure that we that we have that approach and that we that the language is we have a mutual understanding of the language and the language is is consistent with with their intentions. So let me let me just stop there and just to to thank everyone for I'm not asking you to leave. I just have to leave. But um, thank everyone for contributing to this process. And hopefully, we can continue it to move it forward. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Kyle. And um, uh, would, would the panel like to respond?